actors. But just in case, um, I'm going to go over it. I will do it rather quickly because we have other things to cover, but I want to make sure. Okay, here, um, the, the first thing that I want you to do is, uh, at the very bottom, the first thing I want you to do is call that the reference axis. All right? So the very bottom axis, that red line, uh, call that RA or reference axis. And remember what we're doing. We're trying to find or locate the neutral axis for this section. And, and we don't know where the neutral axis is, so we're going to call that Y bar right here. All right, we're trying to calculate Y bar. Um, so down here, we call that RA or the reference axis, and we are going to measure everything from the reference axis. This is very important. Everything will be measured from the reference axis. So the equation says y bar is equal to, well, what we need to do is divide this composite section into two sections of known shape. One is this one. We call that A1. I've called that A1. And the other one, I have called it A2. All right, now very quickly, the equation is very simple. The top is A1Y1 plus A2Y2 divided by A1 plus A2. Let's start with the denominator. The denominator is simple. Simple. A1 is the area number 1, in this case 0.8 times 8, and then plus A2, and that's the area number 2, which is 6 times 0.8. Uh, the numerator, however, as you can see, it is A1, which is 6.4 times a distance. And that distance called Y1. This is where things go wrong. If, if anything goes wrong here, that's where it goes wrong. What's Y1 equal to? Guys, please pay attention. Y1, in this case, is the distance between the centroid of area 1 measured from the reference axis, always measured from the reference axis. In this case, it's 4. Then the second part is A2 times Y2. A2 is 4.8. What about Y2? Guys, this is where you really need to pay very close attention to. Y2 is the distance between the centroid of area 2 measured from the reference axis. In this case, is 8.4. All right, good. You may say, why am I making such a big deal? This is very simple. Yes, it is indeed simple. But let me tell you where things could go wrong, and many times it does. In the heat of things, when you're on the test, you're, you're trying to calculate this, many people, when they're trying to uh, multiply by y2, you know what they do? I don't know why they do it, but this is what they do. You see that yellow line here? They, they treat this as y2. All right? Don't do it. Why is it not right? Because I told you, everything has to be measured from the reference axis. You cannot, in the middle of the calculations, change the location of the reference axis. Does everybody follow? Please, please do, because that's a very, very common mistake. And that's how they will, I will, I will promise you, the very first distractor will be a value they get using what I just showed you. So make a note to yourself. Don't make that mistake. Stay consistent. Measure everything from the reference axis throughout the calculation. Here, as, that is another example how to find the moment of inertia. Use this as a, as a practice. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, 
the bending stress in tension and compression are, sh are shown to you uh, for this problem three on uh, slide number 32. Guys, how are you doing? Um, Mary, Mary is asking, could the reference axis be chosen to be on the top instead of the bottom? Absolutely, you can do that. But if you do it, Mary, be careful. Throughout the entire calculations, just treat the reference axis as the one in the top. Yes, you can choose the reference axis to be on the top, and you will get the correct answer as long as you are uh, consistent in doing so. All right, now, Uh, Elizabeth, um, I assume what you're asking is, would you see that on the test? I doubt that you will see that uh, in the morning uh, exam, in, in the, in the uh, breath part of the exam. If you're taking the structural exam in the afternoon, possibly. I hope I answered your question. All right, now, there is one other topic that I have to cover for you. And this one, this one, deals with the topic that NCEES lists as uh, combined stresses. Once again, when you look at the topics that they, they list, uh, they do say combined stresses. Now, what I am about to show you next deals with, with that, combined stresses. In other words, what we have talked about so far we looked at a beam that's subjected to bending. We calculate the bending stress. Uh, we looked at the shear stress in bending. And in the very, very beginning, I showed you an equation that told you how to calculate uh, normal stress. Remember uh, the comment I made about normal stress, sigma is equal to P over A? Well, we only looked at isolated stresses. In real situations, those of you who are structural engineers, you will, uh, you will agree with me. Um, in real structures, we deal with combined stresses, situations where many of these types of stresses we have talked about occur together. Well, what I'm about to show you is, deals with that. So how do we resolve, for example, let's say a, a, a building. You pick a beam somewhere in the building, and you pick a tiny point somewhere on that beam. Well, given the equation so far, we can calculate specific stresses. But when we combine all these stresses on a real structure on a tiny point, how do we resolve the, the concept that these are different stresses acting on the same point. Well, now that you get the idea and the perspective of what it is we're talking about, let me present to you the calculations that you need. In this particular case, the method that I present to you is called Moore's circle. Moore's circle. And the best way to uh, present it to you is um, through an example, all right? So I need, I know we've been doing this for over an hour and a half now, and I know you're probably tired, but uh, if you can give me another 20 minutes, I need your attention. So um, if you stay with me for another 20 minutes, I'll bring this concept uh, to you, and then um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be done, actually. This is the last concept, but uh, again, requires your attention. Let's assume that this square that I'm showing is represents the state of stress. It represents the state of stress at a given point. And for demonstration purposes, you know, we, we show a large square. But please understand, this is a very, very tiny point on an actual beam, actual structure. All right? So, when you look at the state of stress, 
you, we have these sigma x. This is, let's say, the bending stress that we calculated using mc over i equation. Or we have sigma y. This is the bending stress in the y direction. All right. What about these other stresses? I'm going to show it in, in let's say, blue. This, guys, this is a shear stress. You see that? That's a shear stress. Let me tell you something about shear stresses. These shear stresses are shown acting parallel to the, to the plane. All right? You see that? The red stresses, bending stresses, or axial stresses, they are perpendicular to the plane. The blue ones, those are shear stresses. They are parallel to the plane. The question becomes, if we know those states of stresses, then how would a structural engineer identify the stresses along this inclined plane, the dashed line or the, the red line? All right? So here's the problem. On the test, they give you this square. They say that's the state of stress. They give you values for sigma x. They give you a value for sigma y. They also give you a value for tau xy. Guys, these are not necessarily the largest or the maximum stresses acting on this plane, on this point on the beam. All right? So what we're doing, we're trying to see along this inclined plane, where are those maximum, plane, uh, maximum stresses and where are they located? One method that I told you I'll share with you is called Moore's Circle. Moore's Circle. Moore's Circle basically is a, uh, it is a graphical solution to this problem. This is what I'm going to show you. We need to learn how to transform that state of stress, that square on the top right, to this circle. Mary is asking, is this likely to be on the breath uh, test? Uh, yes. In fact, it is listed uh, on the breath uh, part of the test. Um, but it's not a very difficult concept. Let's go through the problems, and I'll show you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you how we go from that square to what we call Moore's circle. And keep these pages in mind because I may come back to it, page 35. And this one looks complicated. I'm not going to talk about it. When I present the material to you, then you can go back and perhaps check that out. But this is, this is where I'm going to need your help. For the state of stress shown, please determine the principal stresses. Guys, Principal stresses, that's, again, this is engineering lingo. What they're talking about are maximum stresses. So write a note to yourself. When they're asking for principal stresses, they're talking about the maximum or critical stresses. The part B says, what's the maximum in-plane shear stress? Maximum in-plane shear stress. What I'm going to do is use Moore's circle to show you how you can do this. Believe me, guys, this may look strange to you because you it's been a long time you've seen something like this, but it's not that difficult of a concept. So let's do it. This is what we're going to do. Each of these uh, faces of the square, for example, this face. You see that face that I just highlighted as red? That is going to correspond to a single point on the circle that I showed you. I repeat, that plane, red plane that I showed you, I'm going to locate one single point on the circle that corresponds to that. Now, each point on the circle has a x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Are you following me? Do you follow me? Each point on the circle that we're going to create, each point has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. All right. Guys, 